Byzantine sacred art and iconography is not limited to panel painting. We also have a very rich tradition of church decoration. So in this lecture, I want to give you something of a church tour where we'll go through each part of the church and I'll describe the iconography proper to it. Now, this tradition, just like all of our tradition, has developed slowly over time. And what I'm expressing to you is, is more of the late stage of the de development. Uh, the first time anyone wrote down exactly what paintings go where in the church was not until the 1400s. So there are aspects of this that maybe are more elaborate than what you'll see in early churches, but there are other aspects that go all the way back to our earliest examples of, of painting in Christian churches. Our description of the iconography of the, the Orthodox temple actually starts outside of the church in a structure we call the exonarthex, or the, the portico, the porch of the church building. And this area in church architecture does have something of its own proper iconography. Oftentimes in the portico, in the exonarthex, we'll see frescoes or, or depictions of the ancient philosophers, Plato, Socrates, Pythagoras. This tradition may scandalize some, but it's important to note that in, in painting these figures, the church isn't canonizing them. So what this symbolizes, or what this signifies rather, is in this place of transition, in this place between the natural world, the created cosmos, and the redeemed cosmos, there are certain figures that, you know, in the, in the words of St. Justin the Martyr, uh, heard the the Logos Spermaticos, the seeds of the Logos in natural reason. And we as Orthodox Christians have built on top of, of really two foundations, of course the covenantal foundation uh, with Noah and Moses and uh, David, but also another another stream, that of Hellenic philosophy that's that's been fully integrated into how we approach uh, our, our theology in particular. So that's what is being referenced in these these depictions on the exonarthex. So they're still outside of the church, but they're recognizing the logos with unaided human reason, philosophically reflecting on the natural world. As we move into the church building, we come to a, a room called the narthex. Uh, in English, we could say the vestibule. And what this room is, is really a transition between that outside cosmos and a redeemed cosmos. And we do have a, a normative iconography of the narthex. One thing you'll see is there's a focus on the, the Theotokos, the life of the Virgin Mary. So often on the ceiling of the narthex, if it's painted, you'll see the Mother of God um, in a mandela, in a, in a roundel. Also, we'll see lives uh, from the Theotokos, or uh, uh, scenes from the life of the Theotokos, and very often you'll see depictions uh, from the Akathis hymn. The various typologies that come up in the Akathis hymn will be painted on the walls. Another theme that comes up in the narthex is scenes from the Old Testament, uh, particularly ones that are typologically significant to the church. We have the uh, uh, the Ark of Noah, we have the crossing of the, the Jordan, uh, depictions that very clearly point to the new reality that's going to happen in the New Covenant when we enter into the New Covenantal space. Now, the narthex is also the place where people come to transition between the world and, and the heavenly world that, that takes place in the divine services. So this is also a place where Christian piety happens. Uh, oftentimes, you'll see uh, the patron saint of the temple. Their icon will be placed there. They'll be placed uh, to light candles and and, uh, and do your devotions. Uh, we call that the uh, proskinitaria, where you do proskinesis, where you do your veneration of the, the icons of the temple or the mother of God is also a very common one. So all of that takes place in the narthex. There's also a tradition, and I've actually seen this in monasteries, where the minor offices, so not uh, Orthros or Vespers or Compline, but the hours are, are celebrated or prayed by the monks and nuns in the narthex. So it's, it's this, uh, I don't want to say a lesser space of liturgical practice, but it, 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 it doesn't have the same fullness as what happens in, in the nails. With one exception. Uh, so in the in the early church, in that first 
phase of evangelization of the Roman Empire, the Greco-Roman world, there was a tremendous amount of adult baptisms, adult conversions. And to celebrate that, uh, there was a special ecclesial structure called a baptistry. And that, that's appropriate. Uh, baptism uh, is the premier sacrament of the Christian dispensation. It's the sacrament that opens up all of the other sacraments and, and incorporates us into the life of Christ, into the body of Christ. So baptism had its own structure. Uh, over time, baptism... Or over time, adult conversions were less common, and infant baptism became more normative, uh, where churches didn't need, so to speak, that, that entire space. But the idea of the baptistry as this place of transition, this, this introduction into the Christian life, sort of merged with the narthex. And in our tradition, uh, baptisms properly do take place in the narthex if there's not a separate baptistry, or in in a similar space that's an in-between. So if your narthex is very small, oftentimes you'll see baptisms taking place at the um, at the back of the at, at the back of the church, uh, right right by the narthex. And this merger between narthex and baptistry also led to a lot of baptismal imagery being incorporated incorporated into the narthex. Uh, so if it is a baptistry you'll often see a depiction of actually the cosmos itself on the ceiling. So if you see a bearded old man, that is not God the Father. We don't uh, typically depict God the Father in, in iconography. That kind of runs afoul of our whole theology of the icon. And that's actually a symbol of the cosmos, the cosmos who is awaiting its redemption. Also, you'll see the baptism of Christ and Old Testament uh, prefigurations or types of baptism. Uh, Naaman's washing uh, in the Jordan, uh, the crossing of the Red Sea, all of that's very also typical of the narthex. Another icon that's typical of the narthex, because it is this great place of transition, uh, we have what's called the royal doors, and those are the main doors into the, the naos or the sanctuary itself. And these royal doors are called royal uh, because they were very important in the imperial liturgical ceremonial. So when the emperor came to church, he would solemnly process into the church building, and that would begin at those royal doors. Also, the, the emperor would go on retreat, and we, we actually have the text or, or the services of the imperial retreat, and those are called the royal offices. And as offices of or hours, they would be celebrated in the narthex. So there's there's so many connotations of these main doors of the church and their connection to to the empire, or, or, or rather to the to the emperor himself, or the 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 potentate, the, the the monarch. So above these royal doors, oftentimes you will see the great depiction of Christ and the deesis, or, or the supplication scene. So you'll see Christ, often he has the book of the Gospels open, and the passage that's being displayed is, I am the door, or I am the way. Uh, to Christ's, on Christ's right-hand side is the Theotokos, the mother of God, her hands, you know, stretched out in supplication, and on his left-hand side, the Prodromos, uh, the, the forerunner of Christ, St. John the Baptist, also his hands stretched out in supplication. Um, another thing you may see, uh, particularly in Byzantine uh, churches, is the donor portrait. So the, the emperor, the potentate, or the, the wealthy financier who funded the, the church will also sometimes be depicted uh, in these scenes with a little model of the church. And that's the iconography that, that accompanies those royal doors. So as you move in to the, the naos proper, you're transitioning now completely from that that Old Testament. It's not particularly Old Testament, but everything that led to Christ and the new dispensation of the church. You're you're passing now into that fully redeemed cosmos in the the space we call the naos. The naos has a very rich uh, tradition of iconographic decoration, and the earliest examples, we would have an app.
collapse. So we had a, a longitudinal, a rectangular church that, that was culminated in an apse. That's the, the classic Roman basilica. And in that apse, we would have a depiction of Christ. Uh, in some ancient models, it's, it, it's Christ in his transcendent glory, in his divine kingship, in his pre-incarnate uh, form. So oftentimes he's not, he's, he's actually a younger man. Um, but eventually the tradition stabilized as, as Christ in his full, his full potency, so to speak. And we call that Christ Pantocrator, the, uh, the, the maker of all things. Eventually the iconography of that apse migrated to the central dome. So as Byzantine churches dropped a basilica style or, or really merged a basilica style with a rounder style, uh, that, that iconography moved to the to its position today at that central dome. So we will always see uh, the Pantocrator in the center of the church. And typically, there will be a, a chandelier that's being hung down from, from Christ, and that symbolized Christ as light, but also that, that chandelier, that uh, polycandelion, has 12 candles or 12 lamps. And on those 12 lamps, oftentimes you will see um, icons uh, uh, in carved wood or, or, or metalwork of the 12 apostles who are the, the lesser lights, the, the evangelists, those who are called by Christ to, to spread the light of the gospel throughout the cosmos. So that's what's taking place in this, this central dome. And as we cascade down from the central dome, we have a whole panoply of iconography that that takes place. So as we move down, we have another deesis, another supplication scene. If it's a very large dome, you will see the Mother of God, Orans, and again uh, the Prodromo Saint John the Baptist, and also you'll see a myriad of angels. So this is this is like the heavenly hierarchy that we're we're encountering in the divine in the divine liturgy. And as we move further down, uh, oftentimes you will see the Old Testament uh, prophets. Those who, you know, prophesied about the coming of Christ uh, as those first messengers. So in in Byzantine architecture, there's this point where that round dome encounters a square building plan, and that causes an architectural feature known as pendentives and arches. So they're the triangular features that help to incorporate that dome, that that round dome into a square. And on those pendentives, we actually have the symbols of the, the four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, either a depiction of the four evangelists or the four evangelists and their, their symbol. So as we move down from this, this central place, we come into the first tier, really, of the, the iconography of the nails. And that typically is scenes from the gospel, scenes from the New Testament, scenes from the life of Christ, uh, miracles. Um, basically, anything we find in the lectionary can be on the, that first tier of the life of Christ. Oftentimes, they'll even be the great feasts of the church, the 12 feasts. You'll see that. Um, so that's that top tier. Now we can go to a bottom tier, and that is typically are the saints, uh, sometimes depicted in full length. And that's that's quite a nice symbol because uh, the reality of the divine liturgy is that we're really worshiping in the one great liturgy that takes place um, in God's time. So all of the saints are, are ever celebrating this liturgy before the throne of God, and we are incorporated into that. We stand amongst the great cloud of witnesses. So we'll see the saints. And there is a logic to where the saints are in this uh, depiction. So towards the back, we have the most humble of the saints. We have monastics. And as we move in closer to the holy place, we get the great martyrs of the church. Um, oftentimes, if there's pillars in the church, we'll get the, the stylites, the pillar saints, uh, depicted on their pillar. Or we'll get uh, the great military martyrs, St. George, St. Demetrius, uh, who are almost protecting the people of God, standing, standing vigil amongst the congregation. And as we get closer to the holy place, the, the hierarchy of the church mirrors the hierarchy of heaven. So we get um, the, the clerics, we get bishop saints, and all the way to we get uh, concelebrating bishops in the holy place that we'll, we'll talk about uh, next. 
So before we talk about the holy place, we do need to uh, mention <laughs> in, in some detail what is probably the most notable feature about Orthodox Christian architecture, and that is the, the great wall of icons, the iconostas. So that's really the transition between the naos and what we call the Holy of Holies, or, or the sanctuary, or the altar. Yeah. Altar it doesn't uh, necessarily need to only signify the, the holy table. So we have this this transition point, this, this, uh, this really, it's a barrier wall. Uh, in ancient architecture, you'll hear it referred to as a chancel screen um, or chancel barrier. It's, it's, it's all the same piece of architecture. And this is actually one of the most ancient aspects of the tradition. In all apostolic traditions, we find the same architectural feature. In fact, our first reference to it uh, comes all the way back from Eusebius, from the very beginning of the Christian uh, architectural tradition, uh, Eusebius describes this beautiful lattice work of the chancel barrier. So it's, it's remarkably consistent throughout Christian history. And all apostolic traditions have it. The, Coptics, uh, the Coptic Church has it, the Ethiopian Church has it, the Armenian Church has it. It's been reduced now to a curtain. And uh, of course, the Latin Church used to have it. That's uh, The altar rails are actually the, um, uh, what is left of the chancel barrier. So we have this, this, this chancel barrier in, in the Byzantine tradition. Uh, oftentimes you'll, you'll hear it referred to as a templon. Uh, that's actually a, a Latin that comes from Latin, and uh, it actually means temple. So in the ancient world, temples were not, were not interior spaces. They were, they were structures, and the idea of the early Christian church is that it wasn't necessarily a temple, it was a basilica, it was a place for the congregation to come, and there was a temple within the temple. And that's where we get the, the term templon, and that really signified the holy place where the mysteries of, of, of uh, the Eucharist took place. So we have this templon, this, this low wall. And near the templon is originally where we had the proskinitaria, the, the icons that would be venerated and the icons that would be switched out for different feast days. Those would be placed on stands near or on top of the templon. And that's where we get the term iconostasis, which means the place where we put the icons. And those icons were quite variable. They would be switched out as the different seasons and as different saints were celebrated or different mysteries. And over time, some of those icons began to be so regular, so uh, normative, that they were perma permanently affixed to the iconostasis. And we call those icons, uh, in Greek, the despotikoi, uh, or the despotic icons. That's, uh, in English, that sounds rather, rather odd. Uh, it's better to translate it as the sovereign icons, and those are the icons, icons of, of Christ and uh, Christ Pantocrator and the Mother of God, uh, the Theotokos, always, uh, well, maybe I shouldn't say always, but typically with the Christ child. So that will always be the case on a, 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 a modern iconostasis. We have those two icons that have been permanently affixed to the iconostasis. Uh, in some traditions, I'm thinking of the Russian tradition, they've retained some of the idea of that is also the, the proskinesis, the place of veneration, so the icons will actually duplicate it, uh, be duplicated. You'll have the, the sovereign icons on the iconostas, and then you'll have icon stands with candles where people can come to do their devotions, but that's really a duplication of that, that original function. So next to these icons on on the side with Christ, we have, again, uh, the Prodromos, St. John the Baptist, and on the side of the Mother of God, very typically, you'll find the patron of the temple. So whoever this particular church is dedicated to, um, I've heard a tradition of whoever's relics are in the altar. Um, historically, that would have been identical to, to the patron, but that's not, not always the case, or the mystery that the, the temple is dedicated to. So if it's, you know, uh, if the church is dedicated to the Holy Anastasis, you'll have the resurrection of Christ, or if it's the Holy Cross, you'll have the crucifixion scene. So you'll have the patron uh, icon of the temple on that iconostas. So the iconostas 
in our modern sensibility can be somewhat troubling. Uh, oftentimes, I think of certain Protestant Christians who who will point out the fact that you know this this idea of a barrier between us and the sacred is in the Old Testament. But during the crucifixion of Christ, uh, the Gospels are very clear that that barrier has been torn apart, that there, there no longer is a barrier. And that, that's very true. Uh, we, we understand that God in Christ destroys the enmity between God and man by destroying sin, but that doesn't mean we dissolve the symbol. Uh, it's very prominent in apostolic Christianity, in orthodoxy, that, you know, Christ came to fulfill the law, to fulfill the, uh, even the ritual symbolism of the Old Covenant, but he fulfilled it by making it full. He didn't fulfill it by eradicating it. So our, our ritual symbolism that is, goes back thousands of years, it's not just something that's in our head. It's not just, oh, yeah, Christ destroyed the enmity between God and man. The, the, wall, the dividing wall has been, you know, rent asunder. We still have that barrier. But in the, the Christian dispensation, which is very different than, than the Old Covenant, that barrier has doors. That barrier opens up. The whole mystery of, of, of God in Christ making that intercession, making that, that, that journey from heaven to earth and bringing us to heaven, that's very much part of our ritual symbolism. So we, rather than, than keeping these, these types as a sort of an intellectual figment of our imagination, we experience them ritually and liturgically with the doors. And the doors themselves also have their own proper iconography. So the central doors are the holy doors, not to be confused with the royal doors, which are in the narthex, but the holy doors. And on these holy doors, you'll have uh, typically a depiction of the Annunciation. So it's, it's God's entrance into, into material reality in, in the yes of the mother of God. So you will always find that. Uh, to you know, it, to note, it, it's through those doors that the gospel comes out. So the the logos, the word of God, is making his entrance uh, into our reality through those doors, and it's also through those doors that the Eucharist comes to us. So that's the that's the symbol symbolism of the Annunciation. There, oftentimes you'll also find a depiction of the again the four evangelists on those holy doors. So. As we move to the other doors, of course, there's also other doors in the iconostas, the doors that the deacon goes through. So we call those the deacon doors, and also the servers go through these doors. And those are the doors that symbolize this mediation between heaven and earth that's not necessarily Christ, but the angels. It's the circuit of the angels going back and forth between heaven and earth and making intercession. So if you ever, you know, attend divine liturgy and there's a deacon, you'll notice he's constantly going around and around and, and really binding together these different realities that take place in the nails and that take place in the holy place. So on those doors, we very, very often find depictions of the angels, also great deacon saints, deacon martyrs, uh, St. Stephen, um, have even seen Ephraim the Syrian, who, uh, according to tradition, was made a deacon. So it's very, very typical to have that there. So as the iconostas developed it, from this low barrier wall to now a low barrier wall with uh, permanently fixed icons, and then now a low barrier wall with, with doors and also curtains, uh, curtains actually probably predate everything else uh, and are still alive in our tradition and in other traditions like the Armenians. The complexity of the Templon or the Iconostas started to uh, grow. So in the Middle Byzantine era, on top of that Templon beam, we have another series of iconographic de uh, depiction, and those are the 12 great feasts of the church. Um, so again, those 12 great feasts each have their own proper icon, and historically that icon was, was most likely processed and brought in and placed on the iconostasis, uh, the, the place where the icons rest, and that, that function was taken over permanently by the iconostas, so they all move up and become a permanent 
feature. In, in an alternate tradition, you can also find the Twelve Apostles instead of the Twelve Feasts, or even their, their monogram, their symbols on the Iconostas. Um, but that is about as complex as the, the classic Greek Iconostas gets. Later on, the, the structure would become even more elaborate in the, the Russian tradition, where we'll get this even third tier, where again we have the Christ deesis, and uh, extending the deesis will have angels and then Old Testament prophets. And then to crown it all off, we'll have a cross and uh, St. John the Evangelist and the Mother of God at the foot of the cross. So the icon or the iconostasis can be very simple, but it also can be very, very complex. So as we move into the holy place proper, there is um, very ancient normative iconography that goes on in the holy place. So as I said in the beginning, that original structure of the basilica where you have, you know, the body of the church and then you have the apse, that was retained as the church became more round, but the icon that now rests in the apse at, at, at least since the 6th century, if not before, is the icon of the Mother of God. And there's a very famous uh, homily by St. Photius the Great, uh, Patriarch of Constantinople, where he explains why that icon is there. And it's because the Mother of God is the chief archetype of the Church. She is the Christian of Christians. She is the, the woman who, who followed the Word of God. Uh, you know, blessed, blessed is she who, who did who heard the word of God and did it, you know. So she's there, but she's also uh, the de, uh, in Latin, the de, de genitrix, or the, the mitratrix, the, the, the one who mediates between heaven and earth. It's, it's through her yes that Christ became incarnate. And it's through the, the fiat, the yes of the church and celebrating the holy mysteries that Christ again becomes present on the altars of the church. So that's that symbolism of the Theotokos. And the Theotokos often, she will, she will be in the Oron's position, and uh, oftentimes you'll hear this icon described as the Platetera, which comes from the, the hymn of Saint, or the Irmos that we use in the, the liturgy of Saint Basil, and that means she who's, who's more spacious than the heavens. So she's there, uh, arms outstretched, and she really mirrors the church. She is the church. So as, you know, the celebrant has his hands outstretched, uh, you know, praying the divine liturgy, so too she has her hands outstretched, and there's this, this mirroring that happens, and Christ is depicted in the center as Christ becomes present on the altar in the divine liturgy. So there's this wonderful ecclesial symbolism to to the mother of god's place there as the chief intercessor as as the mediator uh, as we move down from the plata terra what we find is a very interesting depiction a very interesting icon known as the communion of the apostles and uh, it's important to note that this is the last supper so to speak the mystical supper but it's also not it's 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 the historical scene of the mystical supper has now been merged with a, a scene of the divine liturgy. So we have Christ himself, who is the great high priest. He's often vested as a priest, um, and he's distributing the holy gifts to the apostles who are lined up um, in a procession, a communion procession, to receive the holy gifts. Oftentimes, the, the scene will be split in two, so you'll have Christ uh, distributing the chalice on one side and distributing the bread on the other side. Um, but what this iconography is really showing us is that, you know, in, in liturgy, it's not that we enter into some time warp into the past. Uh, what this is describing is that the, the mystery of the mystical supper, it's participating in the eternal liturgy of Christ the great high priest. And it's the same eternal liturgy that we are participating in. So there's this very mystical, uh, a very insightful depiction of the communion of the apostles. Oftentimes, it's, if it's a very large space, we'll even have a third tier below that. Or if it's not a large space, this will be on the sides. But those, what's depicted there is the concelebration uh, of the holy hierarchs. So oftentimes you'll see Basil the Great or St. John Chrysostom, uh, the saints who authored our, our anaphoras, the, the great liturgists of the church. 
And what's being referenced there is that in our liturgies, in the liturgies that take place, that the bishop, you know, celebrates and, and the priest in the bishop's stead celebrates, we are participating in that same eternal reality of the, the, the divine liturgy that's celebrated by Christ, the great high priest. So we have all these different levels, a historical level, an eternal level, the, the level of the reality of the celebrating church, all merge and combined in the iconography of the holy place. In the holy place, uh, we have more than just the altar, uh, the, the space where the divine liturgy proper is celebrated. We also have two other rooms that in uh, larger buildings are very distinct, but typically in smaller buildings, it's all kind of jammed into one space. And that's uh, the, the prothesis, the, the area, the altar of preparation. And the uh, diaconion, or where where the deacon, his special space, uh, where a lot of the implements of the the liturgy are are kept, and also uh, relics. So, both of these spaces have their own pr proper iconography. In the prothesis, we have icons that are derived from the actual prothesis rite itself. So, in the prayers of preparation, we have prayers that reference sacrifice. We have prayers that reference. Um, Christ on the cross, we have prayers that even reference the nativity of Christ, and those are depictions that you'll often see in the Prothesis altar. Uh, in the Diaconion, it's a less standard. Uh, you'll often see a depiction of, of the crucifixion scene, or you'll see a depiction of the, the instruments of the Passion, uh, so it's it's, it's referencing uh, those relics, those relics that are stored in that space. That space really is sort of the leftover of a, a separate room or even a separate building of the sacristy uh, that used to exist. Now it's all kind of sh shoved into to one space. Um, and that space doesn't actually, when, when we talk about sacristy today, we really mean where everything else is stored along with the vestments, uh, which is usually a, another room. But... Those spaces have their own proper iconography that are, are tied to their function. Uh, one other thing that we also have in the holy place that has a proper iconography is the bishop's throne. So the bishop's throne is right at the end of the apse, and oftentimes you'll have other chairs for his, his, his college of presbyters for the priests. And the bishop's throne, either on the throne itself or above it, we often see Christ the great high priest in whose stead the bishop uh, reigns. Uh, and I'll just point out that that is the bishop's throne. Oftentimes we think of the bishop's throne as, as the, the chair, the, the grand chair that's in the naos, but that actually comes from monasticism. So in the monastic practice, we'll have uh, the claros, we'll have chairs, solemn benches that, are, that circle the church, and that head chair is where the head of the monastic community leads the services, the abbot or the abbess. Uh, but of course, the bishop is always the head, the head of a Christian community. So when the bishop celebrates a, a monastic office or, or went to monasteries, he would sit in that head chair. And today we just duplicate that. We have a bishop's chair and in a monastery we have a chair next to the bishop's chair where the abbot or abbess um, will preside over the offices. Uh, but that's, that's not technically speaking the bishop's throne, even though colloquially we, we interpret it that way. His, his throne is in the back. And that comes directly from the ancient Roman tradition of this architectural space being built or, or, or being a, an adaptation of the basilica. Basilica, the basilica, was not a temple. It was not a secular or a pagan, or a, rather it was not a pagan space. It was a secular space. So at that throne is where the emperor or those administering justice in his stead, the great judges, would preside over court cases or, or what have you. That's where the, the president, the presider, would, would um, sit. So that is where the bishop typically sits in the, the solemn celebration of the liturgy. You'll note that the priest very solemnly enthrones or sits uh, in that area, not in the bishop's throne himself, but off to the side during the, the singing of the Trisagion, during, uh, right after the small entrance. And that was originally the beginning of the liturgy. So the bishop would come in, uh, even today, uh, when the bishop celebrates divine liturgy in the, in the full pontifical rite, 
uh, that's what he does. He's outside of the holy place until that great entrance, and he solemnly is enthroned at that chair. And what that symbolizes is Christ's ascent into heaven. At the Trisagion hymn, we enter into the heaven reality, and there is Christ uh, enthroned at the high place. So that's the iconography of of the sanctuary. There's all. I mean, there's so much. I, I literally produced a whole book on this topic. So if you want uh, more details, more elaboration on all of the iconography and furniture and its its development and meaning, I, I recommend the book that I that I uh, that I produced called Place of Encounter. Finally, there are certain icons that rest in the church but that are not really part of the, the decoration proper, but um, we need to, to discuss them. And those are the great tapestry icons, the apotathios. Uh, so we have the tapestries that depict the, the death shroud, really, of, of our Lord and the death scene of the Mother of God. And those are used in our services, uh, the apotathios, in the the burial service of Christ. It's solemnly processed around the church and laid into the tomb, which confusingly is also called an epitaphios. Um, and that iconography of Christ laid out in burial actually goes back, it, it's very ancient, it, it, it goes back um, to scenes that were depicted not only on that epitaphios, but also on the, the veils, the liturgical veils themselves. And this tradition is still maintained in our most prominent liturgical veil, the Antimensian. So the Antimensian is, it, it, it is unveiled during the divine liturgy, and oftentimes you will also see the epitaphios or the, the, the uh, you know, Christ laid out in the tomb on the epitaphios, and it's folded up at the end of divine liturgy. So it's only unfolded during the liturgy. Oftentimes it, it contains relics and it it's not, let's say, canonical to even celebrate divine liturgy without the Antimensian. It's, it's blessed by the bishop. So that, that symbolism all comes from that same source of these, these uh, liturgical veils that are used in the services. Um, for the Mother of God, it is also a tapestry that is processed um, as, as part of the preparation of the Feast of the Dormition. So it's, it's sort of mirrored in that way. And you'll, you'll often see these hung in the holy place, uh, sometimes in the naos, um, it, as part of our, our iconographic experience. Uh, the one last thing I'll, I'll mention is we do have a very rich tradition of metal icons, of icons in reposé in ba uh, bas relief that are on the liturgical vessels and instruments themselves. So on the fans that the deacons and later the, the servers, the acolytes carry, you'll see depictions of the angels, uh, the seraphim and the cherubim, who, who we co-celebrate with in the divine liturgy. Also on the chalice. Uh, itself or the discos, you will see uh, so many different scenes. You, I, I've seen the Theotokos Orans, I've seen the Mystical Supper, so that also has its own proper iconography. And in the Artiforian, in the uh, Tabernacle, we also see iconic graphic depictions of the cross, the Mystical Supper. Again, it, it's these, these sacrificial or liturgical scenes uh, that are part of the iconographic repertoire. So our, our churches are just filled with icons, but what I'm trying to convey is that it's purposeful. It's not haphazard what is being brought to our eyes. We pray, yes, in spirit, but also in truth. And when the fathers talk about that in truth, what they mean is in, in the true human reality, that it, we pray with our ears, and we pray with our eyes, and we pray with our spirit. So all of these icons in the church have a very integrated role in what's being done in that area or in that space. So as you go into a church building now, I hope that, you know, the building really comes alive, that it, it, it's allowed to communicate fully as we, we begin to understand and grasp that this is not a haphazard decoration or something that, you know, 
we dislike this depiction here, that depiction there, that's not really how we go about Orthodox Christian life, but that this is a normative tradition that's cooperating with the liturgical reality and, and, and really aiding our participation in uh, uh, what is taking place.